I haven't heard anybody say anything about, you know, printed circuit board shortage. Coming to you on the nightly news. Yeah, you don't hear that, <laughs> yeah. Around, right? Yeah, exactly. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Altium On Track podcast. I am Zach Peterson, and I'm very happy to be here today speaking with Dr. John Mitchell, President and CEO of IPC. Uh, given some recent legislation, I thought it was very pertinent to talk to John, and I think it's going to be a very interesting discussion. Uh, John, thank you so much for being here with us. And uh, you've actually been on the podcast before. And so anyone who's interested will link in the show notes uh, to some of those older episodes. But definitely thank you for being here with us today. Thanks for having me, Zach. Absolutely. So uh, as I had uh, mentioned in the intro, um, there, there is some recent legislation that I think folks in the industry should uh, be aware of. Um, but one thing I, I wanted to just briefly ask you was maybe a little bit about your background and how you got involved in IPC. Wow. I don't think the podcast is that long, but uh, um, so <laughs> briefly, just briefly, briefly, high yeah. level uh, electrical engineering used to be in aerospace and automotive uh, designing cool stuff. Uh, got a business degree and started moving into management of uh, various companies also played in the uh, in the world of Bose. So General Electric, Bose, Alpine is kind of where I worked. Um, and then uh, I did a, a little stint in, in nonprofit, which kind of uh, opened my eyes to what we can do uh, on the nonprofit side. And then along came IPC, which is kind of like the juxtaposition of everything I've ever done in my career, from the electrical engineering to my doctorate in education to uh, management and business and nonprofit, and it all came together. And so uh, I've been here at IPC now for just over 10 years, and it feels like it's been two because there's just so much good work for us to do. How was that for a quick, quick, brief synopsis of my entire life? Uh, that was uh, very interesting, actually, because I never would have thought of IPC as being kind of that intersection between, you know, what you brought, said about nonprofits versus, you know, electrical engineering. But I guess you're right. Yeah, it is kind of that perfect intersection for someone like yourself. Yeah. So it touches it all from engineering to education. The only the, the real thing that it brought new is what we're going to talk about today uh, was is on the advocacy front, you know, government relations, you know, as an engineer, you know, you always sit there and go, man, that government stuff just gets in the way uh, of, of doing good things. Uh, but there's also a benefit to it. It can help us uh, as well and open some doors, which is good. Yeah, I my my view on on uh, the role of government has uh evolved and shifted as I've, you know, gotten older. And um, I think you've, you've hit on a good point is that there, there are things government can do to maybe in, create incentives and set parameters within an industry that drive how it operates. And yeah. I think some of this recent legislation is a good example of that. Well, and we're very excited. I mean, we've been working with the government for, you know, the entire tenure that I've been here, you know, uh, uh, 10 years that I've been here, my tenure and the 10 years, it works well. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, so this most recent legislation that you're referring to, the uh, the Printed Circuit Board uh, Act here that uh, is being co-sponsored out of uh, by uh, a couple of legislators out of California and Utah. And uh, we had them actually with industry leaders on our own little kind of industry forum and, and had a couple of the aides talking specifically about the, uh, the, the, what they're trying to do in terms of, uh, you know, giving tax breaks, breaks to motivate um, uh, the purchase of localized or US-based uh, printed uh, circuit boards. And, and that's, that's a great thing. It was interesting though, you know, one of the things that I've come to learn uh, in, you know, getting more engaged in advocacy is, you know, just because you have something come up doesn't mean you're not that it's necessarily going to pass in the form you described it right there, there's two houses of congress they, there's back and forth and you know you never know where it's going to come but the great thing about this is we're catching the attention of of the congress the members of congress and they're recognizing that this is a real issue that uh, that uh, in this area in the north america specifically in the united states needs to be worked on and so that is, to me, the number one boon of this bill. And as it progresses, I think we'll see what pieces of it stick and where it sticks, right? Um, so uh, right now, it's a, it's a great first step. And we're looking for the industry at large to support it. Because it's saying that, you know, if you're, if you're not talking to your local uh, Congress folks and saying this is important 
to my job, to what I can do, then uh, without hearing that, they're not going to recognize that it is important to their district as well, wherever they may be. This isn't just a Utah and California bill. This is actually something that's helping the entire printed circuit board industry across the country. And so, um, and, and so that's important. And, and as, as you get more and more uh, voice, you know, IPC is, is working to bring the voice of the industry as we have and, and continue to do. Um, what's great Sorry, is then you, you get, uh, um, you get, uh, um, Sorry, my phone, my watch, Siri just apparently heard something from me and uh, I don't know what it was. So I don't know. We can take it out and edit. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so what, what we need to do is have um, folks who are in the industry talking to their local um, uh, congressmen and saying, this is an important thing. Uh, and it's important to us, not just in Utah and California, but it's important across the board. And as we do that, then whatever form it takes, you know, whether it gets adjusted as, as the two Congresses come together or whether it finds its way into the National Defense Authorization Act in different pieces, uh, the important point is they're starting to pay attention. And we've been talking about this literally for 20 years. We've been working with government trying to say, raise the alarm saying, guys, there's a problem. And uh, this is an opportunity to do it uh, at, at a uh, congressional level as well. Can I go on too long about that? I don't know. Uh, what questions do you have? No, it's, well, I mean, it's, it, as any piece of legislation, I'm sure the bill is expansive and detailed. So um, I'm sure there's a lot of moving pieces, but um, I, you brought up something interesting here, which was the, the NDAA or the National Defense Authorization Act. You know, yeah. uh, the recent legislation around printed circuit boards, uh, as far as I know, has not been standalone. It has always been something kind of piecemeal addressing something targeted that has been incorporated into the NDAA. And I think when people think about supply chain security and preventing IP exposure, especially at the packaging level with electronics, they usually gravitate towards defense. I think it makes sense. That's sure. the type of thing that you know any country, not just the US, but really any country would not want to expose that type of intellectual property. And so it makes sense that there are these provisions uh, to try and limit that exposure and maybe keep all of that domestic, you know, in that manufacturing capacity domestic. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that. I think it's the first thought of where uh, supply chain security and having trusted sources comes up. But in increasingly over the last few years, especially, uh, there's an understanding in industry that this may need to go to every aspect and every segment of industry. It's not just a defense thing anymore. It'll probably start there. But as we found with all these supply chain challenges, the better you can secure and, and, and establish trust throughout those supply chains, the stronger those supply chains will be. And that applies to every product. It's not just defense. Um, and that will help in, improve. And so that's why you know IPC works on standards that help uh, transfer that kind of information. And uh, yeah, most of the people implementing those standards are largely looking at defense right now, but we're looking at adapting them to be for, for broader use. So, you know, speaking of, of broader use, um, I, I'd like to maybe make a comparison to what's, what's happening with semiconductors, because anybody who has watched uh, the nightly news over the past year and a half knows that uh, what's the one shortage that keeps hitting the nightly news? It's automotive. And then, of course, all of the chips that go into it. And that's kind of where it starts. But then I think uh, more broadly, it's it's just generally known that there is a chip shortage. And, you know, I get asked questions, oh, are you having trouble getting chips just for your, you know, just because people know that I do design. And of course, it's like, yeah, it's like pulling your hair out sometimes. Um, and so that's what hits the news. And I know that legislators are often very responsive to that type of pressure from the media. Um, I haven't heard anybody say anything about, you know, printed circuit board shortage. Coming to you on the nightly news. Yeah, you don't hear that, <laughs> you know, around, right? Yeah, exactly. So clearly it's not a shortage necessarily in the same way as semiconductors that's driving this. And so I'm, I'm wondering what is driving the momentum? Is it just this idea that, hey, each time you send a, an assembly overseas, there's risks of IP security or you lose control or the costs just mount up due to shipping back and forth? What, what are the, the points that, that legislators so respond to? 
as with anything, there's no real simple answer, right? Uh, if there was, we would have solved it. And so, uh, yeah, it, you know how media works, uh, being in media, right? Uh, right. This is media. Uh, so uh, most media tries to simplify an, uh, a situation. So right now, the supply chain shortage to the common man is a, is a semiconductor issue. And that's all they see. Well, that's not all it is. There are a hundred different aspects of the supply chain problem. There's transportation issues. There's tariff issues. There's, uh, you know, uh, still COVID impacts that are happening in different parts of the world that are driving all kinds of supply chain issues. But if you were to go through the news and try to analyze that, people glaze over, right? And so they pick on the one thing. Okay, it's it's semiconductor, and that is an issue. It's not that it's not an issue. So, uh, but. Uh, what uh, the issues behind the Printed Circuit Board Act that we're talking about are supply chain related. They are security related. They're in, in terms of IP. They are about um, speeding up uh, things. So there's a lot of different aspects that go into this. Um, so, uh, and when you craft a, a, a bill, like you said, you know, legislators pay attention to certain things, you know, uh, if you have, you know, think about, uh, you know, I always think about, uh, I don't know if you guys remember Conjunction Junction, you know, the the, uh, the schoolhouse uh, schoolhouse rock where they taught us how to how how the government works with the, you know, I'm a bill, but I you know, remember it vividly. Yeah, so they 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 walk through this, you know, there was an accident, there was a school bus accident where some children were harmed, killed, and that got legislation being very quickly. Uh, uh, economic issues that uh, cause voters in their districts to ca cause them pain, lose jobs, not be able to get the things that they need, that gets people to move quickly. And so there's strategy to politics as well, in terms of what are we going to actually um, focus on? What are the hot buttons we're going to push? And, and how do things flow through the system? And so there's, there's a lot of that that enters into it. I'm not saying it's perfect or that it's, you know, bad or anything. I'm just saying it is what it is. And so you need to know how to play the game. It's like, it's like playing basketball. If you don't know the rules and you walk on and just pick up the ball and walk to the other side and then put the ball up there and say, Hey, you can't do that. You, you got to dribble. Uh, but uh, politics is the same way. There's ways for it to work. And some of those ways are evolving. Uh, you know, with just a, a lot of in, ingrained um, uh, bipartisanship. But uh, one area where bipartisanship doesn't seem to be as ingrained is on supply chain issues. And so that's a good spot to start where we might actually get some action there. And we're excited about getting some movement uh, uh, on this bill, as well as uh, any other pieces that might ad adopt it or adapt it as it goes forward. So to, to what did extent, I answer your question? Uh, uh, yes, uh, okay. in, in a way, yes. <laughs> uh, what I'm what I'm wondering is this, I think this relates a little more broadly to the role of IPC and then some other organizations that I know uh, have have uh, argued for legislation like this. What is the IPC's role in influencing how legislation like this might be crafted? Is it, yeah, so is it as a lobbying organization in, in the traditional So sense? we do lobbying officially. We've worked directly with both of these um, uh, congressmen's office, uh, congress uh, people, person's offices as we've, uh, as, as it was crafted even before it saw the light of day. And so we've been heavily involved, which has been great. Uh, and then as it starts to see the light of day, we've been uh, instrumental in pulling other organizations into it as well, because it's not just uh, you know, uh, the more voices that are heard, the better. And so we, we're pleased to see other organizations picking up the flag and saying, yeah, this is a great thing too. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I, cause I, I ask because I think most people see IPC and then they want to put four numbers after it, citing some kind of technical standard. And they maybe don't see what the IPC also does in terms of lobbying, as we've been talking about, but then also sure. education. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we are basically we sit on uh, primarily three pillars standards we've been doing for 65 years, which is why that's kind of the default. Everybody sits there and goes, oh, it's the IPC standard education we've been doing for 30 years. We certify over 100,000 people every year. We provide 
uh, training and skills training now uh, that we've been developing uh, with hundreds of industry companies. So it's not, again, these aren't, we follow the same pattern that we do um, with our standards. IPC doesn't create standards. The industry creates standards. IPC shepherds the process. IPC doesn't create education programs. The industry creates the programs and IPC leverages their in, uh, in instructional designers to make it uh, using the latest education science to make sure it's something you'll remember. And then we distribute it and, and, and get it out there. Uh, we don't come up with the bills. Uh, we have committees of industry players that uh, say, hey, these are the top issues. IPC, go off and, and work with your uh, IPC's lobbyists and our lobbying teams that we uh, work with contracted both in North America as well as in Europe. And we also do the same kind of things in Asia. Uh, the We do on behalf of the industry. Uh, what, uh, you know, we try to solve their problems. That's what we are about. So right now, what are the top issues uh, that we hear from industry? Their workforce. There are things like um, uh, the supply chain. They are advanced packaging issues. And so IPC is at the forefront of trying to solve that with those three tools, through standards, through education, and through advocacy. And so uh, we're really, uh, you know, we're probably, you know, it's, I love that people know us as a standards organization. That's great. I love that they recognize that we're the leading entity in electronics training across the globe. That's awesome. Uh, but they don't see that. That's not the first thing that comes off their mind. I wish it was, you know, right there. They're like, oh, because uh, we came up with a great acronym. Uh, SEA, C, Standards Education Advocacy. That's what we do. And that's how we solve the big problems of the industry. Globally. Right, right. And, and um from a global perspective, um, I think it's important to ask because, you know, you and I are in the U.S. Um, and so we tend to talk about things from the U.S. perspective. But I'm, I'm wondering, is there this same kind of onshoring or nearshoring type of push in other in other countries? So, yeah. Uh, so there's there's been a shift uh, over the last, I'd say, four years uh, to from a view of being global and being, you know, the globalization of the supply chain to a more regionalization. And it's more making sure that I have a resilient supply chain. It's not that global uh, supply has gone away, and I don't think it ever will go away, but you want to make sure in times of crisis. I mean, we had uh, the whole COVID pandemic thing that caused issues. Now we have a, a war going on, you know, between Ukraine and Russia is also causing uh, issues. So having a resilient supply chain, uh, and having that regionally is important. So uh, people are localizing specific areas. So in the US and Europe, yeah, semiconductors, advanced packaging, uh, and certain types of capability, they're trying to make sure that they have the capacity to do what they need to do. Does that mean they're not going to use uh, sources anywhere? No, it doesn't mean that just means that uh, hey, I've got to figure out the right way to do things because uh, I don't expect the entire supply chain to exist in Europe, the entire supply chain to exist in North America, and the entire supply chain to exist in Asia. I don't expect that at all. I expect it there to be pieces of it in you know in those places and key pieces of it. Uh, but there'll be other aspects that it just doesn't make any economic sense to try to do that uh, uh, as you go forward. So you'll have other mechanisms to utilize parts that might be available in other parts to create that resiliency. Sure. Uh, now you, you talk about regionalization, and um, this is something that I've thought about and also talked about myself in terms of like, what is the right number? What is the right market share for North America, let's say, you know, because currently I think uh, production capacity or to, uh, as a fraction of total capacity um, in the U.S. is like, it's it's a single digit number, I think, right? Like four uh, For printed circuit boards specifically, yeah, yeah, of a 60, if, uh, I'll just use round numbers, of a $60 billion global industry, uh, the U.S. produces on dollar value something like four or five percent. Okay. And okay. most of that's defense. Sure, sure, yeah. So it's not, if you go to volume, the number actually gets smaller because defense pays more for that. And so the dollar value is higher. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So the actual, let's say the actual number it might be of, like 3% of volume. Okay. So the actual like number of orders or some other metric is actually going to be smaller than just looking at the dollar value because of the right. value add in, in, in an area like defense and aerospace. Right. And, and it's not terribly different in Europe. 
you know, it's around that, you know, again, that single digit 5% ish. If you go almost all of the printed circuit boards in the world are developed in Asia. Sure. Um, so I, I think it's, it's fair to ask and maybe, you know, play devil's advocate a little bit and mention that, uh, okay, you're producing a lot of defense products domestically. That's fine. So what else needs to be produced, uh, produced locally? Why not let every toaster oven or every, you know, every, every, every circuit board for a toaster oven or microwave be produced overseas? Are you actually arguing that they need to be produced in North America or in Europe or close to the end customer? Where, where, do, you, where do you draw the line? Because I think yeah. that's more important than putting an arbitrary number up there and saying, well, okay, the industry is $60 billion. We need to produce $6 billion of it in North America. Let's yeah, see. I don't think the discussion has gone around how much, but one of the big challenges around this discussion is, okay, if we're going to build uh, certain types of expertise, uh, in, in this country. So defense is a quick one. Uh, right now, there's a lot of focus, as you mentioned, on semiconductors. And the advanced version of PCBs is advanced packaging, you know, IC mm -hmm. substrate, OSAT type of capability. And that's really lacking in this country. And part of the debate around that area is, okay, if we're going to build semiconductors here, are we actually lengthening the supply chain? Because if we don't have IC substrate and, and OSAT capabilities here for those kinds of products, you build the chips here, you're going to ship them somewhere else so you can utilize that, put them on board and then ship them back. So you actually made the supply chain longer. And so you have to, it, 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 and to go build that capacity for those things, you know, if I want to build an IC sub, a, a state of the art IC substrate um, uh, facility here in uh, North America, in, in the US or in Europe or wherever, and you need to make sure there's a business that's going to sustain it. Uh, so will the semiconductors actually use that one? I don't know. So, so there's, there, there, there are all kinds of questions um, about this. This is not easy stuff. This is why it, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, you know, you're trying to build the right controls. You know, what are the right product lines that should be built in whatever region you're talking about? And that's a very challenging discussion there's economic factors there's government factors there's pride factors there's all kinds of things that come into it um and uh time will tell uh what we try to do at ipc is advocate for the industry uh, and so that's why we listen heavily to the industry we don't sit there and tell the government what the right answer is before we check with industry industry is who guides ipc's voice because we are the voice of industry uh, I, I see, I see what you're saying. And, um, I, I think when you talk about the entire industry and you talk about the entire supply chain holistically, it seems more like the focus is on greater investment generally, and maybe let the market work out what the right mix of IC substrate domestic manufacturing is, or work out what the best number of printed circuit board manufacturing you know, facility maybe, growth is. maybe I think you, there needs to be some guidance there as well. Okay. You know, in a pure world, right. The, the economic world, the economist world where they sit there and say, Oh, well, market forces will sort that all out. Um, it was kind of there, but then we find countries kind of inserting themselves and saying, well, actually uh, this group said that this is important to us. So we're going to put a tariff on that. Right. Well, that kind of screws up the free market a little bit. And uh and people go, wait, this is not a competitive advantage. All of this stuff is being built in, you know, Taiwan or in China or, or somewhere else that's not here. We're going to lose jobs. Well, suddenly there's a national imperative to that. Or they may say that we want to own this thing. So, so there are so many factors. So just saying that we need to let the free market prevail is nice, but the free market doesn't really operate as a free market. There's a lot of um, people... Uh, cooks uh, put it, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen yeah <laughs> people stirring the pot to try to make it go their way and because of that i don't think you can just let it go um, but you need to decide what games you want to play or, or what, what avenues you want to make a difference for your particular country or region okay so then it there there really is a mix of considerations beyond just you know what's the right number of facilities what's the right market share yeah, i mean the and there's there's also, like I said, you know, 
right now we have we have basically a, a lot of fab companies, but we don't have a lot of IC substrate companies. Mm -hmm. There's capability here. And now, is it the latest, greatest for the future? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but they're going to go jump, you know, potentially billions of dollars in, in that. It'd be nice if they put a, a, a few billion dollars also aside for the rest of the industry so you can actually support it. And that's, yeah. that's part of what we advocate for on, on the rest of the supply chain, instead of just the semiconductors, which we think is a great thing. We think that investment is wonderful. Just don't forget rest, about the rest of the ecosystem, which is what we've been preaching for 10 years. It's a, it, there is an ecosystem to be considered, not just a specific uh, one thing that hits the top of mind. You know, to the general user of electronics, uh, uh, it was interesting. Uh, one of the uh, aides that was speaking with us said, you know, two years ago, I didn't even know what a semiconductor was. And so for most people, their phone, they don't think that there's a printed board in there. They don't think that there's assembly that has to take place. They don't think that that silicon actually has to sit on top of an IC substrate and gets assembled into its own sub uh, assembly or, uh, you know, and then added to a, a board, et cetera. They don't know any of that. Okay. All they think about is, does my app work? Well, and, and speaking of... Something and can like I get phone, my device? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I still can can't get my it. PlayStation 5. It's killing me. <laughs> but a year and a half. Uh, yeah, I'm sure many major purchases have been put off because of that. Um, but I, I think there's just this more perception more broadly about, you know, those green pieces of plastic that get put into different devices. Maybe somebody, you know, pulled apart their toaster oven one day and saw, oh, there's a circuit board in there. Yeah, oh, cool. That's cool. Right. But I think what that might have people... been the last time or it might have sent them on a path to become an engineer. Either one, you know, you just don't know. I hope the latter. But, but I will <laughs> tell you. So 10 years ago, when I first started this job, we were working on uh, trying to get some modifications to the U.S. Uh, uh, understanding that printed circuit boards. The thought was it's a cheap piece of plastic. We can buy that from China. It doesn't need to be secured. And we actually fought for a long time to get that actually written in as it is a protected IP device. That was one of the first advocacy efforts that I was involved in here at IPC. That was only 10 years ago. And that was for the government, okay? And they didn't get that this, oh, well, and there was argument. It wasn't like, a oh, we had a friendly discussion, they got it. This went on for weeks and months before it finally got written in. I, I will be honest, 10 years ago, um, when I was, uh, yeah, when I was still a graduate student, I have to, it's not that long ago, but when I was still, uh, I, I had finished my master's um, and, you know, when I did my master's, I had done a very simple PCB and then I never touched the things until, you know, actually working in industry, but I was, you know, doing research in, in optics and, and semiconductors. Mm -hmm. And I always had this kind of perception that it was just an overblown way to connect chips together. And I had no idea of the engineering that goes into it. And a lot of my students didn't either. I, so many students wanted to go work at Intel, you know, cause here, here in Portland, I was teaching at Portland state, but we have a big Intel campus and, you know, sure. Intel was on campus a lot, you know, recruiting. Hey, when everything. I did my double E, that's where I was headed to. I did my VLSI design course. You know, we were going semiconductors was the hip and cool stuff, man. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, at the time, like this, the discussion was so much about like, you know, Moore's law is going to come to an end and what's going to be the next, the next thing that gets you to the next hump. And, you know, so many people want to put their effort and their, their mind towards solving that problem. And so I think it's understandable that for a long time, engineers kind of gravitated in that direction. And there was all that focus. Um, so it, it's really refreshing to see that, you know, people are kind of coming around to understanding the role of the PCB. Uh, not just as an engineered product, but also for these other issues that we've been talking about for supply chain security, things like this. You know, the thing that woke me up to that was, so I was working at uh, Alpine and uh, Alpine is largely known as a sound company, right? Mm -hmm. And we had, we had these guys laying out uh, amplifier boards and the curve of the run would provide noise. And now think about it in terms of high speed. If, if in audio things, that is generating noise to a, a speaker coil. Imagine what it's doing now that we're running at gigahertz, mm -hmm. right? And the kind of noise that's being generated in there. So all aspects, as we get smaller and faster, uh, you know, 
heat is critical. Connections, super critical. I mean, just because you have the coolest semiconductor in the world, you plop it down in a board and there's a chance it might not work because it wasn't designed right. And so having the right, you know, having people that are properly educated in how to design a board to work with certain types of, you know, high speed electronics, et cetera, is critical to electronics working, especially as we move into the future. And so I just see a, a bright future for the printed circuit board industry. And it's a high tech future. You know, this is a future where we're using the latest, greatest tools. We're looking at doing additive uh, uh, technology on boards now as opposed to just in semiconductors or, or you know, additive and subtractive. So we're using both here. Um, the designs that you're having to consider are the same kinds of considerations as these runs get tighter and smaller that used to be the things that would only semiconductors would think about. And so, uh, determining whether the future can actually work or not. So I think the, the last, question I might have is is uh, around the momentum and how to maintain it. Because if you look at the dollar amounts in like the CHIPS Act and the FAB Act and anything supporting semiconductors, they're an order of magnitude larger than what is uh, in the uh, Supporting Printed Circuit Boards Act. So clearly this is not going to just be a, a one and done thing for the printed circuit no. board industry. How do you maintain that momentum? Do we just keep the conversation going? Is it just a repeated push by lobbyists? What has to happen? So, so every country is different, okay? One of the uh, challenges that the U.S. specifically has on this front is that the leadership of government changes so often. There is no U.S. strategic plan, okay? There isn't one. Uh, and... While we may have this CHIPS Act today, you could have elections change and they could see a lot of it either blow up or get thrown away with the next group of leadership. That's a challenge in this country. Um, whereas you have other companies in Asia, why many board companies and other companies have gone to you know, Singapore, China, Taiwan, wherever, is because they'll give them a 10-year plan and they follow it. And so they're like, wow, I can invest in here with security. The, the government involvement in this can be a boon, but it's also a risk because things are constantly changing in this country. Hey, we've got this tax break. Great. Next year it went away. What the heck? How, long, how, do you, how do you make a business plan on that? So there's a lot of challenges to that. So what do we need to do? We need to continue to have a voice. And what IPC does in the, on, on its DC front of advocacy is we play with the cards that were dealt, you know? We did different things with the Trump administration, different things with the Obama administration, different things with the Biden administration. In order to try to, our, our boss, our leader is the electronics industry. We're trying to make sure that one succeeds because that's the long-term play. And uh, it's not a four-year horizon. I totally agree with you. And I'm, I think we're going to have to leave it there because we're running a little low on time, but it's definitely an inspiring message. And I, so I, I hope, hope so. I answered your questions and, and, and gave people a, a little flavor of, of some of the complexities and challenges that we work on. But uh, thank you for the opportunity to share, you know, hey, we even got to touch on standards as well as our, you know, education as well as advocacy today. So awesome. We, we hit them all. Absolutely. And, you know, we'd love to have you back in the future to discuss some of those other issues. Happy to. Great. That's great to hear. Well, thank you so much, John, for joining us. Um, this has been a really insightful discussion. And um, to everybody that's out there watching on YouTube, make sure to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button to see future episodes, and uh, check out the links in the show notes to go learn more about this new legislation and to learn more about IPC. Um, and get involved. Mitchell, yes, get involved. Absolutely. Get involved. It rests on you to get involved, the viewer. Um, thank you so much again, John, and um, to everybody out there watching. Uh, don't stop learning, stay on track, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.